Hi, everyone, and welcome to what will surely be an enjoyable and important discussion with Secretary Robert Gates on American foreign policy. I'm Jim Falk, the president of the World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth. Dr. Gates has been a valued friend of our World Affairs Council for a number of years, and I know as well that he has been a stalwart supporter of World Affairs Councils across the country because he recognized that we represent an interested, informed citizens about foreign policy. We're especially grateful that Dr. Gates agreed to join us just two days after the publication of his remarkable book, Exercise of Power, which surely will be soon at the top of the New York Times bestseller list. You know, each December, uh, I'm presumptuous enough to send out to our members uh, my top 10 books. And I have to say that now, midway through 2000, I know which book is firmly at the top of my list. Special underwriting for this program was provided by Bell Aerospace Company and the law firm of Haynes and Boone. Additional support was provided by Marianne and David Alhadef, as well as Kirk Teske and HKS, the architectural firm. Now, knowing that you are indeed eager, just like I am, to begin the conversation, my introduction of Dr. Gates' uh, remarkable career will be abbreviated to the extreme. In fact, knowing this audience, I suspect that you could recite his resume pretty quickly. But let me just say that Dr. Gates did serve as Secretary of Defense under President George uh, W. Bush and Barack Obama. He began his career as an officer in the U.S. Air Force, and from there he was recruited by the CIA, and he later became director of the CIA during the administration of George H.W. Bush. He was a member of the National Security Council uh, for four administrations, and believe this, he worked under eight presidents uh, representing both political parties. Now, my son and son-in-law are alumni of Texas A&M University, so I have to highlight that Dr. Gates was president of Texas A&M from 2002 to 2006, and he's curr currently chancellor of the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg. Dr. Gates, great to be with you. Thank you again so much. Thanks for having me, Jim. So a central theme of your book is truly the failure of our country to effectively use um, our non-military assets. And as you say, you call this um, a remarkable symphony of power and that we have drifted over the recent years uh, uh, really to using our military might as, as the first option what do you think led us to neglect what really did work and enabled us to win the Cold War? I think that it really began right after the end of the Cold War and, and believing that we were invincible and that uh, we sort of stood atop the mountain, uh, we began taking apart or weakening uh, really all of the elements of national power, the instruments of national power that had contributed so much to victory in the Cold War. You know, people haven't, I think, thought enough about the fact that while the Cold War with the Soviets took place against the greatest arms buildup in the history of the world, there was actually never a direct military conflict between the two countries. And over the whole course of the Cold War, somewhere between 50 and 150 Americans were probably killed by the Soviets in one way or another. What happened in the, in, in the background, since everybody knew the, the catastrophic consequences of a military clash, the conflict really took place using non-military instruments of power. Now, part of that was the use of surrogates, but, but a big part of it was technology, uh, economic tools such as sanctions, such as uh, technology transfer limitations, strategic communications played a huge part in it. Our, the Voice of America, Radio Free uh, Europe, Radio Liberty, uh, all the covert things that CIA did to smuggle books and magazines and cassettes into the Soviet Union about freedom, uh, the use of religion, the use of nationalism, the use of cyber, the use of covert action, uh, we had this whole array of tools that we used and they were all robust. I mean, um, the USIA, U.S. Information Agency, in pre and under President Eisenhower and President Kennedy, especially when Edward R. Murrow headed it, mm -hmm. uh, under President Reagan when Charlie Wick headed it, was an incredible uh, force multiplier, if you will, for the United States. But after the end of the Cold War, 
uh, the funding for and diplomacy, above all diplomacy. After the end of the Cold War, uh, all of these instruments moved to the back. They, they were defunded in 1998. Congress dis disestablished the USIA. Um, they wanted to eliminate uh, the uh, US Agency for International Development. Clinton stopped them from doing that, but tucked it under the State Department. Uh, our strategic communications, again, became a very small part of the State Department. Its head doesn't even report to the Secretary of State. Uh, and uh, foreign aid's always been the least popular um, uh, thing in foreign policy for the American people. That, that uh, reached new lows in the, in the Clinton administration. So all these tools basically withered. And now we find, and, and the result was, we ended up with what I refer to in the book as a kind of a 19th century tricycle with a gigantic front wheel which represent, which was the Defense Department, and two tiny back wheels, which represented all the other instruments of power. And, and the result of that was, in my belief, that after the end of the Cold War, presidents more and more began to look to the military as, uh, as their instrument of first choice rather than a last resort. And so we ended up with an over-militarization of our foreign policy. As the saying goes, when the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. And, <laughs> and so we overused our military in no small part because all the other instruments were so weak. And I think that contributed to us ending up in 20 years of war. The military were given tasks they had no business trying to take on or being assigned. Uh, after the initial military victories, for example, in Iraq and Afghanistan. So, so I think the whole theme here is that, that the tools that helped us succeed in the Cold War, we now have to realize are going to be essential for the long contest ahead of us uh, with both Russia, but especially with China. You suggested in, in your remarks just now that, in a sense, a lot of the responsibility on the reductions was with Congress, especially when you're talking about USIA or USAID. And in a sense, the president was unable to, to, to adjust that. Is that a fair statement? Well, I think it's a fair statement, but I would also say most presidents didn't make much of an effort. Um, uh, one of the instruments that was significantly weakened was the Department of State. Uh, and our diplomacy. Now, I will give first president, uh, second President Bush credit. There were two periods during the Bush 43 administration when, when there were additional resources given to the State Department and additional people, but that was kind of a brief bump or a brief window in time. And, and so the result was that uh, over time, uh, even diplomacy uh, was significantly weakened. I used to I used to joke with Condoleezza Rice that, um, or she used to joke with me that I had more people in military bands than she had in the Foreign Service. We'll come back and talk more about the State Department in a few minutes. Uh, we have a, a question that I think you'll enjoy because it's from your good friend, Ambassador Robert Jordan, uh, who served with such distinction as uh, George W. Bush's ambassador to Saudi Arabia. And he says, uh, Secretary Gates, you talk about great power competition and the need for American primacy. Why should Americans care about this? I think one place where American, successive American presidents since the end of the Cold War have fallen short is in educating the American people in explaining to the American people why our international leadership is critical to our own future, why it is in our own self-interest. Uh, the fact is that uh, we cannot isolate ourselves from the rest of the world uh, in, in the 21st century. We've seen that in the COVID virus. We've seen it in the economic circumstances. We've seen it in climate change and a whole host of other issues. We can't just, our, our ocean barriers uh, just are, are totally irrelevant under those circumstances. The question is, I think, and where, where we've fallen short is that because of the over-militarization that I described, many Americans have come to 
equate international leadership with being the global policeman, with the world policeman, and sending our young men and women uh, abroad uh, to fight in conflicts that don't affect our national interest, or they don't understand why they affect our national interest, and for interminable periods of time. Uh, we've been at war for 20 years. So I think most Americans uh, have seen global leadership as both expensive in, in both lives and treasure, uh, as not necessarily serving American interests. And what our leaders need, need to under, help the American people understand is that it's only through American leadership that we can shape the international environment <coughs> to serve our interests. To have, in other words, it's, it's, we have to work to make our alliances stronger we have to reform our alliances. We have to reform and improve international institutions like the World Health Organization. But walking away from them simply gives the Chinese open field running. It's basically a gift to the Chinese to run these international institutions. So if we want to shape the international environment in a way that serves our interests, we have to be engaged, we have to be involved, and we have to do the hard work of trying to make them better. And I think this is both an effort uh, that presidents have not undertaken. It's also an effort to educate the American people on what needs to be done that has not been undertaken. You know, one of the things that I particularly enjoyed about your book was how it was um, divided up. And so you really focused on 15 cases where the United States intervened. And for once, I'd like to start on a really optimistic note where it worked and that was Colombia. And if you might briefly tell us about why Colombia was a success story. So Plan Colombia began in the Clinton administration uh, and, and really at first was focused on the counter narcotics mission. And, and when, when the president of Colombia, Pastrana, proposed Plan Colombia for the first time to President Clinton, it actually started out as a social reform movement, uh, how to help the peasants in uh, Colombia find alternative employment so they wouldn't so they wouldn't do drugs or so they wouldn't grow drugs and and you could weaken the uh, the drug culture and the drug economy uh, in Colombia that then morphed in, over time <coughs> into a into a counter narcotics campaign uh, and then ultimately into a counterinsurgency campaign against the FARC uh, the the uh, radical uh, leftist uh, insurgent group in, in Colombia. At one point, the Defense Intelligence Agency basically said that Colombia was within a year or two of being a narco state, a criminal enterprise. And, and, and so this program, the reason it succeeded, in my view, was first of all, um, the American assistance program was to help the Colombians help themselves. Uh, the number of Americans on the ground in uniform uh, was uh, limited by Congress to initially 400 people and then ultimately no more than 800 people. So we were essentially helping the, the Colombians build their own capability to take on uh, the insurgents. It was also an effort that was dominated by the State Department. It was run by the State Department out of the embassy. And at one point, the embassy in Bogota was the biggest embassy in the world, biggest U.S. embassy in the world, later supplanted by Baghdad. So this was a State Department uh, uh, dominated effort by the United States. You had the support of the Congress. Uh, and, and this effort was able to be sustained through three to four different presidencies. So. We had time to make it work. We had a, a strong local partner, particularly in President Uribe uh, of Colombia, who took the leadership. You had existing institutions in Colombia on which we could help them build and strengthen. And there was a social component to it. The, the military equipment, police equipment dominated, mainly because it's so expensive, but there was a significant percentage of the money that went into creating um, uh, training for judges, 
went into improving the legal system. Over, the, over a period of 10 years or so, the Justice Department trained 40,000 Colombian lawyers, uh, judges. <clears throat> so, so it was a civilian dominated effort. It was bipartisan. It lasted a protracted period of time and the local partner was in the lead and was not corrupt and was dedicated to the rule of law. And we had and success and, and, and left. Let me, as you can imagine, we have a number of questions on China, but I'm gonna ask the first one here. And it's, you included in the book, a quote from Sun Tzu's The Art of a War. And I quote, to subdue the enemy without fighting is the supreme excellence. So is China's strategy to replace the U.S., or are they trying to reshape, in a sense, the international order that we talk about so much for its own purposes? I think that they are uh, trying to reshape the international order for their own purposes. I think they uh, have the confidence that they are uh, the rising power and that we are a declining power. I think this has been made much more explicit uh, by Xi Jinping than by any of his predecessors. Uh, and in a way, I think it's a sort of historical uh, Chinese perspective of, of returning to the, its place as the, as the greatest power on earth that they held for a couple of thousand years. As I like to say, they had a couple of bad centuries, but in the context of Chinese history, that 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 period is over, and they are, and they expect to be treated with the deference and and the respect due a power that's as old as they are and as important as they are. Uh, I do think they intend to reshape the international environment. We see that in what they're trying to do in all of the institution, international institutions of the UN. Uh, and, and creating their own institutions, such as the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, um, the Belt and Road Initiative, and all of these different things are aimed at, at, they, at them creating and shaping the international environment uh, to serve their interests. And also, talk a little bit about just their projection of force, because I was not aware that they had a military base in, in Pakistan and in one in their first, I guess, foreign base was in Djibouti. Um, how are we reacting to that and what, what, what's their objective? Well, I think, I think actually the power that's more concerned about that than we are is probably India at this point. But yes, they've created their first base in, uh, uh, in Djibouti. Uh, they're building uh, the port of Gwadar in Pakistan where they will have a uh, I think a 50 year lease. Uh, they may be looking at creating others as part of the Belt and Road. They already operate, uh, own and or operate something like three dozen major ports around the world. But it's especially in the South China Sea where we've seen them be the most aggressive uh, in terms of their military uh, exercises. And particularly I would say in the last few months, uh, it's really built up. So you're seeing them uh, send their aircraft carrier around Taiwan. You're seeing their aircraft encroach on Taiwanese airspace. Very aggressive actions against both Vietnam and Malaysia. Um, they're patrolling aggressively. You've seen the moves on Hong Kong uh, and the security law. So I think, I think partly because they think we are badly distracted by our economic crisis, by the uh, virus, uh, COVID crisis, and by our race crisis, uh, they see opportunities to be even more aggressive. And I think we're seeing a lot of that just even in recent days. And let me just highlight a number that you had in the, in, in the book about China's military budget has gone from 20 billion in 1998 to 170 billion in 2018. And as you said, that's just their official budget. Talk about what's happening in, in, in Hong Kong and, 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 and what tools do we have in Hong Kong that we could use that wouldn't be punishment uh, to the residents of Hong Kong that we have no wish to, 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 to punish? Well, I think that's where it gets really complicated, Jim, because it's very hard to, to I mean, the, the tool that we love the most is economic sanctions. And, and we use it all the time. Uh, we, we throw sanctions at any country that looks at us cross-eyed at this point. It's gotten to the point where I'm sure many of your business uh, members can tell you it's, it's very hard for 
for companies uh, to see their way through the welter of uh, sanctions we have on so many different countries so that they're not in violation of U.S. law. But, but I, think, I think our moral voice is important in defending the people of Hong Kong, in trying, and I think we can try and deter the Chinese from um, actually applying the law that has been passed uh, that would result in the jailing of, uh, uh, of protesters and, and perhaps taking them back to China. Uh, and, and I think there we can threaten additional economic sanctions against China should they apply the law, but they would be applied against China, not against Hong Kong. I, I, there's a lot of legislation in the Congress that would change the, the protected nature of Hong Kong in terms of our laws and their economic activity. I, I think that's guaranteed to hurt the Hong Kongers more than it hurts the Chinese. And so my view would be uh, our, our moral voice, but also letting it be, cl being clear with the Chinese that if they actually try to apply that law, uh, that there would be an economic uh, consequence for them. This is one of those places where having allies and friends would help because if, all, if a variety of nations, if the Europeans and the Australians and the Indians and others joined us in warning the Chinese about the consequences of moving on Hong Kong, it would have a far more powerful uh, impact on the Chinese than us doing it alone. So uh, Michael D says that he, uh, one of our members, he was the first CEO, CFO of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. And he believes that it was a you know, tragic mistake for us to not be involved in some of these alliances. In your view, how serious of a mistake was it for us not to be in the TPP? Uh, I, think, I think this is a place where we have bipartisan mistakes. I think President Obama made a terrible mistake in not joining the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. That bank is funding a number of the projects uh, in Belt and Road, and it actually, our membership might have given us some voice in the selection of those projects in terms of making them more economically viable and so on. It might even have opened some opportunities for American companies, uh, but we're out. All of our allies went in, uh, and I think the bank now has over uh, well over a hundred um, member member nations. So that was Obama's mistake. I think President Trump's mistake was walking away from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Again, the Chinese love to negotiate bilaterally because with most countries, they are in a position to intimidate the partner. When you can get eleven nations, eleven Asian or Pacific Rim nations together and speak as one voice to the Chinese, particularly if they were led by the United States, it has an impact that any single country acting alone, including the United States, won't have. So I think that it was a, a, it was a really big mistake uh, not to uh, continue to move forward with the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And now, irony of ironies, the Chinese have inquired about being able to join the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So, so uh, they would be in and we would be out. be out. Deborah Schultz says, don't forget to ask him about Taiwan. And, and, and I would add to that, and we, we certainly don't want to draw a red line because that hasn't helped us, but what are our options? Well, I think I, I, the Clinton administration once described their policy toward Taiwan as, uh, as uh, strategic ambiguity. I, I think I think ambiguity is the last thing that we uh, that we want uh, when it comes to Taiwan because she feels President Xi feels especially strongly about wanting to have Hong Kong and Taiwan reincorporated into China while he is president. So I think we need to be very clear first of all to the Taiwanese that if they do something provocative such as declare independence they're on their own. On the other hand, we need to be very clear to the Chinese that absent that kind of a declaration, absent of that kind of a provocation, if they try to do anything with respect to China, uh, with respect to Taiwan, we will come to Taiwan's defense and they should be under no illusions. 
Let's talk, go back to the State Department. I'm not sure if everyone knows that the story about you met with uh, President-elect uh, Trump and suggested that uh, our Dallas resident, Rex Tillerson, be considered to be Secretary of State. Uh, I suspect he's forgiven you, but actually- Yeah, I, I, think he's, he's, I think he's, I think Rex is talking to me again. <laughs> <laughs> but in all seriousness, uh, Mr. Tillerson, Secretary Tillerson, really came into the State Department with the idea to reform it. And he was unsuccessful, and in a, in a very real sense, the building turned against him. What mistakes did, did he make in trying to change the, the, the culture of the State Department? And how should someone else be more successful? Because throughout your book, you do state and, 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 and characterize the State Department as being overly bureaucratic, antiquated, and it needs changes. Yeah, and it's a... Um... Um, it, it, it stifles creativity. Uh, it's not bold. Um, and so I make, I make the argument in the book that state needs to be reformed and restructured. And when they've done that, then given more people and more money. Uh, and I argue that a reformed state department should be the hub of all non-military U.S. Uh, instruments of foreign policy. Uh, an example of this was another success, which was President Bush 43's uh, PEPFAR initiative, the HIV AIDS uh, initiative, in which <clears throat> he, put, he put responsibility for carrying that policy out in the State Department, but he empowered the coordinator of uh, the initiative to control the budgets and the programs of all the other agencies in the government to work this problem together. So you had one person in the State Department who had budgetary authority and programmatic authority that brought the entire government together. It's one of the few instances you can point to of a genuine whole of government effort. And I believe the State Department ought to be the hub for other kinds of activities along those lines, but it does need to be reformed. I think that the challenge facing the reformer in the State Department is that it that that person not only has to be empowered by the president who shares that agenda but also have the support of the Congress. The Congress is very protective of the bureaucracies. Each of the committees of Congress is very protective of the bureaucracies that come under uh, their supervision or their oversight. And, and the committees in the Congress tend to be just as conservative as the bureaucracies somebody may want to be tr trying to uh, fix. I ran into that all the time with the Defense Department. You know, if I tried to cut, a pro no matter how anti-defense spending a member of Congress might be, God forbid that I should try and cut one single contract or one single job in his or her congressional district. So the State Department doesn't have that kind of uh, congressional intrusiveness and support, if you will, but, but it does face, uh, it, it does have very conservative and cautious oversight committees. So any, any attempt to reform the government in terms of national security is going to have to require, first of all, I think a high level agreement between the president and the congressional leadership that this is an idea whose time has come and that then empowers the people at the cabinet level to work with the Congress in figuring out how to change these institutions and bring them up to date. This is not something a single reformer can do coming in at the top uh, and, and essentially acting alone. It has to be done in cooperation with the White House and, and with the Congress. And Tillerson brought in largely outsiders. We, we have a, a question from a person who used to work at the Central uh, CIA, and he asks, how concerned are you about the future of the agency and our intel community? And actually, I'm not sure if it was a he or a she who asked that question, so I apologize. But I, I, I'm, I'm okay with that. I think, I think it's going to be okay. Um, you know, it's, it, it is a reality um, that nearly all presidents dislike CIA. Uh, Richard Nixon once wrote, 
what the hell do those clowns do out at Langley anyway? And Jimmy Carter, after the fall of the Shaw, sends the director a note, I am not uh, satisfied with the quality of intelligence, of political intelligence. Uh, and they were far from alone. Part of the reason presidents don't like CIA is because CIA's analysis, for all practical purposes, grades the president's homework. The president goes out in a press conference, he says, you know, things in country X are going just great. And the next thing he knows, he's got in his hands an assessment from CIA that says, you know, the truth is things in country X are going to hell. And what's worse, all of those CIA assessments go to the Congress. So it's just ammunition in the hands of a president's um, uh, enemies. I'll give you another example of why presidents don't like CIA. So the Bush administration, Bush 43, was putting enormous pressure on our allies and others to support uh, severe sanctions against Iran to stop its nuclear program, its nuclear weapons program. In the middle of that effort, the intelligence community issued a national intelligence estimate saying, oh, by the way, this was in 2007. Oh, by the way, the Iranians stopped their nuclear weapons program in 2003 totally cut the legs out from under the initiative of the Bush administration. And you, no president is gonna be happy about that. But it is the, there are two things about CIA that, that are important. First of all, they, it, it and the other intelligence agencies provide what I call the daily river of information that informs the president and the Congress and the Defense Department and the State Department of what's going on around the world the capabilities of our enemies, how their economies are doing, their military capabilities, the technology of their military, all that information flows day in and day out out of the intelligence community. Presidents always like the covert action capabilities of the CIA. I call it the hidden hand of the president. So however much the presidents may rail at CIA and be unhappy with their assessments and so on, um, every president comes to at least tolerate the agency and, and whether they know it or not, they depend on that daily river of information. And, and that's why I think uh, at the end of the day, the intelligence community and CIA will be okay. The other thing is that for all of the criticism and all of the uh, arguments to the contrary, CIA in particular, I think works very hard not only be apolitical, but to be uh, completely honest in their assessments, to, as the saying goes, to speak truth to power. And it's another reason why, why I think secretaries of state and, secretary and presidents sometimes don't like uh, what they have to say, because um, what, the, what the intelligence community says often is so Im implicitly is critical of what they're doing. I like to say the firmest proof that I have that CIA does not politicize intelligence is that I've never once heard a secretary of state or a secretary of defense or a president say, boy, I sure love the way those guys support my policy. Not once in the last 50 years. Here's a question I think you're gonna like because you wrote a, quite a bit about it from Joshua Lynn. Non-military, regarding non-military instruments of power, it seems that the U.S. government is not as good as it might be with information, warfare, or marketing, especially compared to American companies. How can the American private sector, world-class expertise, make its way more effectively into the U.S. government? This is actually one of the recommendations for improvement that I have. We, we do not have uh, the billions of dollars in the U.S. government to try and replicate China's Belt and Road uh, Initiative. But, but what we can do is figure out a better way to bring to bear the enormous economic power of the American private sector. And where we need to be more creative is figuring out a partnership between the government and business where government can help incentivize business to invest in developing countries and in, and in projects that use local labor, that benefit the local community, that avoid corruption. I, I think these kinds of projects, even if they were uh, a certain fraction of uh, the Chinese Belt and Road 
uh, would have a big impact. I tried all through the, all through the 1980s. I tried. Uh, the CIA produces a huge amount of basic information on other countries, their bridges, their road networks, their electrical networks, their water systems, and so on, a whole infrastructure. For a company thinking about investing in a foreign country, that kind of information, they often have to spend a lot of time and money getting. I wanted to give that information to companies interested in investing in those countries. And I worked through seven or eight different secretaries of commerce, none of whom were interested in pursuing it. So I think there are opportunities for the government to enable and to uh, assist uh, our private sector in getting engaged in the, in, in the developing world in a way that gives us a powerful uh, competitive uh, position vis-a-vis -vis what the Chinese are trying to do. Um, you know, the Zoom platform has this thing where you can do a thumbs up if people like the question, and you probably will not be surprised that we have several people who have asked, what are your thoughts on the revelations of, you can guess which book, John <laughs> Bolton's book, which will probably be wrestling with you to see which one is number one. <laughs> well, I have a feeling he will sell a very great number of books. Um, I think your book has a longer uh, shelf life. I, I, um, I, I, I guess I would say that I worry a lot if the allegations that he makes in his book are true. You have any reason to doubt that they are, aren't true? Well, um, you've worked with him. I suspect. I've, I've got, actually our paths <clears throat> really didn't, haven't crossed. Uh, he was at the UN when I became secretary of defense. And, and so we really didn't, uh, we are acquaintances, but we haven't really worked together. Um, he obviously has a, uh, he has a reputation for having taken, taken copious notes. Um, and, and so I think you have to take seriously uh, what he has to say. And I, I would just say that assuming those uh, assertions are true, it's, it's very, very troubling. Do you think that he should have testified or gone to totally, the totally? I think that, you know, he he complains that uh, he uh, allegedly in the book he complains that he didn't testify because uh, he felt that the impeachment inquiry was too narrowly focused and and was headed in the and focused only on Ukraine. Well, there is based on what I've read that he's written no one could have helped fix that better than he could have in terms of broadening the, uh, the, the scope of, of concern. So uh, it's hard to avoid the conclusion that uh, he elected not to testify uh, so that he could sell a, a heck of a lot of books. Uh, Secretary of Defense uh, Esper, as well as the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, they were in an awkward position and they both have apologized when they joined President Trump to walk across uh, Lafayette Plot Square to, to St. John's Church. Um, one of my favorite books that you wrote too is called A Passion for, for Leadership. And so if you had been in the Oval Office, how would you have handled the situation? And, and, and put another way, with all due respect, do you think you would have had the confidence to say, Mr. President, uh, this is not appropriate? Well, I, I, you never know. Uh, uh, you know, I've talked to people, I, I, all the years that I worked at the White House, and I worked there for four different presidents, I've seen people out in the outer room uh, waiting to go in to see the president and sort of pounding their fist, and I, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to give him what for, and I'm going to tell him exactly what I think, and so on and so forth. And they walk in and they're meek as church mice, and yes, sir, Mr. President, and uh, good morning, sir, and how are you, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's, it's very hard to put yourself <clears throat> in that position. I will say this. I <clears throat> I think my most direct confrontation with a president was in a private meeting with President Obama, and it was over the, the strategy for getting rid of don't ask, don't tell in the military. And he, gave, he wanted me to 
uh, as a price of getting the, the courts to delay an immediate um, overturn of uh, don't ask, don't tell, for which we were completely unprepared. Uh, he wanted me to stop enforcing the law. And I told him I couldn't do that. I said, you know, you're the lawyer, but as far as I'm concerned, there is law and there is no law. Uh, and, and what you're asking me to do is in fact, the most direct, is violate or ignore the most uh, directive element of don't ask, don't tell legislation. And I can't do that. Uh, and, and he got very angry and he finally said, well, I'm not gonna make you do anything that you think is wrong. And that's probably the angriest he got with me. So based on that experience, I would like to think uh, that I would have said, um, Mr. President, this is not appropriate for, for either the chairman or I to be involved in. Because we're really supposed to be, the secretaries of state and secretaries of defense traditionally have been apolitical. Obviously the military has to be apolitical. But secretaries of state and defense and the attorney general for that matter and the secretary of the treasury are supposed to be apolitical and basically focused on what's in the best interest of the country. So I think, I think, uh, I think they both recognized they'd been put in a spot. I think they both frankly weren't quite sure what was going to happen uh, in Lafayette Square. I think that uh, particularly in the case of General Milley, I think he believed that they were going out to to greet the National Guard troops that were out there and just thank them. Uh, and I think it's one reason why once he realized the photo op that was shaping up, he managed to evade it. But uh, I think he did the right thing in apologizing and re-emphasizing the importance of the military remaining uh, apolitical. Another area I think where you and President Obama disagreed was over uh, Libya. And uh, that was certainly I think a challenge about whether, when we first went in, it was for humanitarian reasons, and then they were mission creep. I wonder if you might address that for a moment or two. Well, he was, he was from the very beginning, torn about uh, interfering in, uh, in Libya. He, he uh, or intervening, he, he, had, he had run for president on how he believed the war in Iraq was wrong we need to be successful in Afghanistan, but it was pretty clear once he got into office that he also was eager uh, to get out of Afghanistan as soon as we could. And so you know, his approach, and he stayed out of, out of the Syrian civil war. So his overall strategic approach was to avoid further involvement or engagement uh, in the Middle East and particularly in, in the conflicts in the Middle East. I think the reason he finally decided, and he once told me it was kind of a 51-49 decision uh, to go in was, although it wasn't in our national interest, it was in the, the, the British and the French in particular believed it was in, and the Italians believed it was in their national interest uh, to, uh, to go in. I think he was sold on uh, the military intervention also uh, because of Gaddafi's threats to essentially kill everybody in Benghazi. Uh, and so he made the decision uh, to go in. Now, the irony is for a president who as a candidate criticized and as a senator had criticized the uh, Bush administration for its failure to plan for the post-invasion uh, situation in Iraq, there was zero planning for the post-intervention uh, uh, environment in Libya. There was no planning by the United States or by our allies or by anybody about what would happen after Gaddafi. So um, I felt it was a bad mistake. We, we were stretched thin uh, in two different wars still in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and and I, I said in the situation room, I said, Mr. President, uh, we're already involved in uh, two wars. Why do you want to go looking for a third? And, uh, and the truth is everybody in the national security team um, at the most senior level uh, disagreed with going into Libya. And the only person at the end of the day among the principals who ultimately supported that decision 
with Secretary Clinton. Uh, and I think that probably tipped the balance uh, for the president. There, well, we have a presidential election in just a few months. And so there are a number of questions that ask how long will it take to restore our diplomatic relationships with the rest of the world, particularly with our closest, and this uh, person has put in quotes, former allies. How, endangered, how endangered is democracy is another question. Where do we stand now among nations? So roll all those together, <laughs> get your thoughts. Well, I, I think, um... I think that the risk of authoritarianism uh, is increasing. And part of it is that I believe in a lot of countries, uh, over the last dozen years, the American uh, model, if you will, has been discredited. Uh, the economic crisis of 2008, 2009 uh, made many around the world think that perhaps the American uh, form of capitalism, the American economic model is not one that we want to emulate. And then second, uh, I think that our political paralysis, our inability to, it's not our polarization. We've been polarized since the very beginning of the Republic. I mean, Jefferson and Adams, the things they said about each other would, would seem pretty harsh even in today's environment. But what's different and different in the last number of years is paralysis, where we can't successfully attack any of the major problems affecting our country, whether it's immigration or infrastructure or education, uh, um, uh, climate change or a host of others. And, and even the appearance that we've bobbled uh, the handling of the pandemic. And so, and so now people look at our political model and say, well, is that what we really want? By contrast, the Chinese are out there making the argument, we work, we got on top of the pandemic. I don't mention that they were, shall we say, uh, a little uh, 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 overdue in reporting what was going on inside China and so on, uh, and their role in helping to spread the thing outside of China. But, they point to their economy. They brought hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. They point to their infrastructure. They point to initiatives such as Belt and Road and so on. And so they're making the argument. They're not making the argument for communism. I, I say in the book, Maoism is as dead as a doornail. The Communist Party really just is a framework for maintaining an authoritarian, authoritarian control in China. But my worry is that that kind of authoritarian model uh, in the absence of strong American leadership and a strong American model has appeal around the world. So I do worry that we're backsliding uh, somewhat around the world in terms of the spread of democracy from all of the high hopes uh, that we had after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So Stephen Cox asked this, and Stephen, I apologize for not reading your whole question. Would you not say the president is hypocritical by trying to quash protesters with violence and the government after fighting socialism for so long has neglected necessary reforms, now leading in a sense for popular support for socialism in our country? Well, I think, I think, um, uh, I think our domestic situation in some respects, uh, and, and I'll talk about policing in particular, in some ways parallels what I've been talking about in the over-militarization of our foreign policy. Uh, we, have, we have funded our police in, in most cities pretty generously, but we have not well-funded other kinds of organizations, uh, community organizations, that might deal with homelessness and mental illness and drug addiction and so on. And so you're asked, just as we asked our troops in Iraq and Afghanistan to do nation building in terms of addressing social issues for which they were not trained to deal with and to address uh, development problems, I think often the police are asked to address problems 
that have more to do with, as I said, homelessness and mental illness and, and so on than, um, uh, than they do with policing. And so, I mean, my personal attitude is the answer is not to defund the police any more than I would cut military spending. The answer is to increase the resources that are available for so many of the underlying problems that put the police in difficult positions. Obviously, dramatically better police training is in the cards and really must take place in terms of de-escalation. So my, my brother-in-law was a policeman for nearly 30 years and he virtually never had to draw his service revolver. He told me he never, he found very few situations he couldn't talk his way through or out of. And so I think training of police and so on is really important. But I think, I think people need to think about not so much defunding the police, but how do you build up the community institutions uh, that get at some of the underlying problems? Absolutely. Well, you'll like this question as well because it starts gigam, sir. So <laughs> definitely in, a, in, a, in a Aggie. Uh, your thoughts on how significant a threat information warfare is to our society? particularly in terms of its effectiveness via social media, and how do we deal with it? I think it's a real problem. And I, you know, I don't think, at least at this stage, that the Russians uh, or others have the ability uh, to shape the outcome of an election, uh, in part because the way our, our electoral system is so dispersed uh, and is so local that trying to actually affect votes, uh, I think is very complicated and would be a big challenge. But where they can be enormously effective, and I think have been, is in trying to um, uh, aggravate the divisions that we already have in our society, uh, to turn us against one another, uh, to sort of scrape the scabs off of, uh, of wounds that we have of various kinds uh, and, and to feed disinformation into the process so that people believe conspiracy theories and, and mm. various other things. So I think their ability to disrupt and aggravate internal problems is very real. Their ability to actually affect the outcome of an election, I would be skeptical. Um, I wish we could keep you for another hour, but I know we have about four more minutes. And I'd like to ask you to talk about Pakistan, because in the book, you didn't hold back about Pakistan's duplicity and particularly your thoughts about General Musharraf. You wrote, I believe the Taliban were adamant in not giving up bin Laden to the United States, in part because the Pakistani military did not want them to do so. So why did we give Pakistan so much latitude? I think in part because uh, they had been an ally for a long time. They were an ally in uh, our efforts to uh, um, create problems for the Soviets and then eventually eject the Soviets from uh, Afghanistan. Uh, and once we went into Afghanistan, Pakistan became a virtually irreplaceable uh, line of communication. Our, our supply lines for our troops in Afghanistan mainly came through the port of Karachi and, and through Pakistan. And frankly, it was one of the reasons why I had concerns about the bin Laden raid was that I was fearful that whether we were successful or not in getting bin Laden, that the Pakistanis would immediately cut off our supply line to Afghanistan, causing us to lose the war overnight. Uh, so, so the supply lines were really important for us, uh, and 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 I think also based on uh, past uh, cooperation and in, in taking on the Soviets in Afghanistan, were the primary uh, things. And and also I think for a long time. Uh, we regarded Pakistan as an ally against the Soviets more broadly. Uh, back to, to China as we wrap up. Um, one of the questions is, uh, should, can we, how, how do we handle the debt? Uh, how does China handle the debt that uh, they have extended to other countries, especially in, in Africa? Well, for one thing, that some of these countries are pushing back. And so both Pakistan and Malaysia have 
uh, downsize the Belt and Road projects uh, that have been agreed to in their countries uh, and, and at a lower cost. Um, uh, new leadership came in in both countries and essentially and essentially made that happen. That's happened in some African countries as well. Uh, the Chinese also have been relatively flexible about renegotiating debt. There, people talk about them taking over the, the airport or the port in Sri Lanka because the Sri Lankans couldn't pay what they owed the Chinese. That's a rare exception. In most cases where countries had problems paying the, the debt, uh, the, the Chinese have been willing to renegotiate it in, in one way or another. So I think you'll see a fair amount of flexibility. As I mentioned in the book, uh, Xi and others have talked about wanting more accountability in Belt and Road. So I think they're kind of attentive to the criticisms of Belt and Road and they've made some adjustments in it. But the importance of Belt and Road, I think, is illustrated by the fact that she has had that program now inscribed in the Chinese constitution. And Dr. So Gates, that this is a program that's going to go on for a while. Let me ask you to respond to this question in 30 seconds. That's pretty unfair, but I know you were a professional briefer. What is North Korea looking for by raising tensions on the Korean Peninsula? Are they just trying to get attention? I think that they're, they're signaling that negotiations have come to an end. Just as the attack on the uh, Shonan uh, South Korean warship and the artillery shelling of uh, South Korean islands, we believed at the time were uh, Kim Jong-un trying to show the army that he was tough enough to be the leader. Uh, what we may be seeing in some of this is Kim Jong-un's sister showing she's tough enough to take a leadership position as well. Well, on behalf of nearly a thousand people who have been listening to you today, and I'm sure they're all book buyers, I hope they'll go to interrobangbooks.com. Thank you so much for spending time with us. In fact, Gideon Rose, uh, the editor of Foreign Affairs, had a review that must have made you very happy in the New York Times. Gideon wrote, Gates says what he thinks and refuses to pull his punches. And as a result, the book offers in one volume the most accurate record available of recent American security policy and the most sensible guide to what should come next. It's been wonderful spending the hour with you, sir. Again, I want to thank um, especially uh, Bell Aerospace Company and Haynes and & Boone and our other supporters. And have a great evening. And Dr. Gates, we look forward to seeing your book, number one on the New York Times bestseller list. Thank you, Jim.